Welcome to this impromptu lecture. Uh, I'm a former professor here. I used to lecture in this theater to autometry students. And out of a class of 80, I probably had almost as many as you show up each day. It was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> so appreciate having so many people. It was always good. So higher likelihood we'll all stay awake, though. <laughs> so then, higher likelihood we'll all stay awake, though. Yeah, oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, are interested. That's right. I'm glad to see so many people interested in this topic of optics. Now. <clears throat> okay, so the, the motivation for this study, or for this presentation, was that um, Matt came to me about you know nine months ago or something and said he wanted to have a deeper understanding of how we calculate the, the point spread function of the eye um, using geometrical optics. And as it turned out, I just finished writing a paper on that topic in which I basically took textbook knowledge and tried to translate it into something an optometrist or a vision scientist could understand. Because it's, it's rather technical language when you read it in real, real optics textbooks. Um, and so that kind of is the basis of what I'm going to present to you today. In a way, this is part two of a lecture. Because about, you know, I don't know, maybe four years ago, I last talked to Pete's group about the mathematics behind power vectors, which have been quite popular in, in optometry in the last 20 years or so. Um, and it was Vizwa at the time who wanted to have a deeper understanding of that. So I'm going to start with a review of three or four points from that lecture, and then I can tell you more about calculating uh, the geometrical optics uh, point spread function. Okay? So Max said to me, he said, if you read my smart lab code, which I write for educational purposes only. And he cleans it up until it not likes her. And he says, what's this about the Pauline's Jacobians and Gaussian curvatures? Um, this is like a foreign language. Uh, and the question is, what does all that mean? And how do we make use of it <coughs> in, the, in our kind of optic, optometric optics? <coughs> well, the short story for anybody who has to leave early <laughs> is it's an extremely simple result. If you have a wavefront with principal curvatures, reversions, the uh, with principal uh, yeah, curvatures, or vergences, as we say in our comedy, V1 and V2, then the Laplacian of that wavefront is just the sum of those two vergences, which is to say it's twice the mean. Right? It's just twice the mean. And in optometry, we say that would be the mean spherical equivalent if you're talking about lenses producing this wavefront um, vergence. That's all it is. And the Gaussian curvature turns out to be the product of those two vergences, the principal vergences. So one is the sum and the other is the product. That's kind of the bottom line. Um, but these are results. These are not definitions. So if you really do want to have a deep understanding of how you get to this result, we have to go through the steps necessary to achieve the result. So we have to explain a little bit about what is Laplacian. What is a Jacobian? What does it mean when you talk about Gaussian curvature? And how does that all end up leading to this uh, very simple result? So that's what I'm going to try to do for you. I'm going to give you a, a mathematical background that's going on. Now, Norberto, I'm sure, can tell us who said, if we see further, it's because we stand on the shoulder of giants. Was that Goldstrand? Some famous, I can't remember what famous scientist said that. Uh, but in this case, it's absolutely true. Um, these quantities I'm talking about, they're eponymous quantities. They're named after very famous people. For example, Laplace. Pierre Simon Laplace, a Frenchman, born in the 18th century. He is responsible for the Laplacian differential operator that we want to make use of. And that's what produces this thing called the Laplacian. Carl Gustav Jacobi, yeah, a German, uh, later in the 19th century, he invented the Jacobian determinant that's responsible for producing the Jacobian method for producing the wave of the point spread function. So another very famous guy, of course, Carl Friedrich Johann Carl Friedrich Gauss, extremely famous in all branches of science. Uh, he's known as the Prince of Mathematics, one of the greatest mathematicians ever. Uh, and he is going to tell us what Gaussian curvature means. Well, it gives more elementary results, you see. And I'm also going to make use of uh, results from Reinhard Euler, mathematician, where his interest in topology, complex analysis, and optics. And he gave us a very 
useful theorem about how the curvature of it or the smooth surface varies sinusoidally with meridian. It's actually fundamental to understanding things like spheral cylindrical refractive error and refractive power. So these are the guys that were standing on their shoulders. So I'm going to begin with the textbook definition of curvature. Just make sure we're all on the same page of what these words mean. The mathematical definition of curvature arises from a consideration, and it seems a bit indirect. I mean, normally you might just think curvature is the inverse of the radius of curvature, right? But when you start defining curves with an equation like y equals you know x squared or something like that, um, there's a different approach that works a little bit better. And this is the approach here. You have your curve, um, and you're interested in the curvature at a point. This curve has to be in a plane. We're not talking about curves in three-dimensional space. It has to be in a plane. And we draw a tangent to that curve at the point of interest. Well, that little tangent there has a slope made with a horizontal called an angle phi. And as you move that point up and down the curve, the slope changes. Because it's a curve. Why? The slope is going to change. And the slope of that change is angle phi, and curvature is defined as the rate of change in the slope t as of this tangent uh, as p moves along the curve. So it's a little more indirect than just saying it's the inverse of the radius, but it leads to the same result. But this, re this way of formulating it uh, works better when you're doing uh, making equations to define the curves. Now, we're actually interested in the curvature of surfaces, whether it be like a, a lens surface or I'm going to talk mainly about wavefront surfaces, the two dimensional surfaces um, in, in a three dimensional uh, environment. Um, and for example, here's, here's a beautiful astigmatic surface. That's the, the, um, the red one. We want to know about its surface. And the way you have to approach that, since curvature is based on curves that are in a plane. You have to imagine a plane intersecting the surface. Okay? And so here's two examples. And I chose the two examples of planes that intersect the surface um, with the maximum curvature. And those two maxima, the maximum and the minimum, are those are the principal curvatures of that surface. And as I said before, we're going to find out that you add them or multiply them and you're going to get the answer, right? according to the, the rules we're going to develop. <clears throat> Now, in optics, we typically choose, I mean, there's an infinite number of planes that can go through that point, but we typically choose um, planes that are perpendicular to the surface. And we do that because rays are perpendicular to the surface. And we'd like to try and track a ray, see what's, where it's going, and so we'd like to keep the ray kind of in the picture. <laughs> we want to keep it in the plane that we're playing with. So, so. I want to go with any angle. We typically choose planes that are perpendicular to the surface at a point. So that's the beginning. Now, if you go to a math textbook and look up a definition for curvature for a function, you know, y is some function of x, um, you get a horrible looking formula like this. It's, you know, it's, it's really complicated. I remember as an undergraduate thinking, God, why is this so complicated? Uh, it's partly complicated because you're working your way up a, a surface and its slope is changing just because you're moving up the surface and you really want the radius of curvature, but you get this slope in there as well that's kind of mucking up the calculation. So you have to compensate for how far you moved up the surface. And that's why what you see in here is a derivative uh, with respect to x, the derivative of y with respect to x, that's the slope of the curve, you have to include that in a calculation. But it turns out that if the surface is really pretty close to the floor, like the wave fronts, we're going to be looking at the wave front aberration functions, um, you're never very far into that domain where you have to worry about the slope itself. And so it simplifies that <coughs> much simpler to the curvature being the second derivative of the function. The second derivative. And that's an easy one to calculate. So if you have a function, you know how to differentiate, simple calculus, pick the second derivative, and you've got the curvatures uh, of that point, at that point, curvature of that, uh, of that curve. <clears throat> mm -hmm. 
All right. Everybody with me so far? So now let's try to get a little bit more optometric in this application um, where we can introduce Mr. Euler. Mr. Euler came up with it, and he was interested in topology and, and um, differential geometry. I think he practically invented the field, differential geometry. Um, and one of the great things he did was to say that if you have a smooth surface, um, the curvature at a point on that surface, you know, in a plane perpendicular to the surface, is a very simple formula. I don't know if I can get this, uh, I can't quite reach that high. Can I uh, get a. No, 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 no. Oh, uh, the bottom, the three dots. Right down there, yep. where's my uh, bingo? Oh, I can almost see it. <laughs> I see. Where's my laser pointer? The, can you see the laser pin? No, oh, there it is. Laser pointer. Yeah. Is that it? It's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So I'm at the top line up here, and he's proved you know, by you know his mathematical genius mind. All with the derivation that the curvature for an arbitrary angle phi. So now imagine this plane sweeping around in any meridian we choose. It's equal to the sum, a weighted sum of the curvatures in the x and the y plane. So it's like kind of breaking it down into the two components. And the weighting is quite nice. It's cosine squared for one term and sine squared for the other term. So you take the horizontal curvature and multiply by cosine squared, you take the vertical uh, well, the curvature and multiply by sine squared, um, then you'll have the curvature in whatever reading you want. Now, if you put this into sort of optometric terminology and maybe change a few variables and think about the optical power of a lens as a function of meridian uh, or the wavefront vergence of a plane wave that went through the lens. This is my favorite mantra. Lenses have the power to change the versions of light. If you remember that, you always get an A on mine's in. Lenses have the power to change the versions of light. So if we have a wavefront coming into a lens, the lens has some power, it's astigmatics, it's spherical equipment, all that. When it comes out, it's a wavefront. And that wavefront has the same power as the lens. But now this, what we don't talk about the power of that wavefront anymore, we're talking about its versions. They're basically the same concept. So the vergence becomes a simple function, or power either one, is what an optometrist was going to want to call the sphere component and see the amount of sigmatism or the cylinder component. So it's almost like a prescription for a lens. Now, a few years back, with Doug Horner's help, we could find something called power vectors. And this is how that development worked out is they will just change variables uh, I mean, uh, rewrite this equation a little bit first so you take this cosine squared and use a trigonometrical identity to put it in terms of cosine of the double angle cosine of two theta instead of cosine squared of theta um, and now you got a formula that looks like this got these three terms and what we did was very simple idea to take these two terms and bunch them together because that turns out to be what optometrists call the mean sphere. It's the sphere plus half the cylinder. That's the mean sphere. So we call that in. That's the mean sphere. And you see over two, that's what's left over. That's what we'll call, that's the astigmatic component that varies around the spherical of the mean sphere. And we call that J in honor of um, Jackson. And Jan, Mr. Jackson, the doctor. Um, ophthalmology at the beginning of the 20th century uh, invented the Jackson cross cylinder and as a test for you know, looking out your stigmatism on an eye. So, in honor of Mr. Uh, Jackson, we call that J. So, this becomes the formula now for how power varies with the meridian. And it actually varies just two times the meridian, because as you know, as you sweep around from, say, um, axis 0 to axis 180, you're kind of back to where you started. Because there's no difference between this plane and this plane. One's an axis zero, one axis one eight. It's the same result. And that's why to get the full benefit of this math, we double the angle so that as you sweep around, you get 360 degrees. And these power vectors now can be added together and, and you can do fun things with that. All right. So we ended up with this definition of mean and uh, mean sphere and a moment of a signature. Okay, 
So that's about the where I got to when I talked last time to this group. But one thing I did not do at that time, and I really ought to do, because it's really useful here, um, is to think about how power varies in these two principal meridians. Uh, I'm talking about principal in the, in the zero degree meridian and in the 90 degree meridian, or it's all vertical filters. How do they vary when you let the axis of the cylinder be any of the thing? Give any axis at all. Not just that simple case where the axes really are vertical or horizontal. The axis can be anything. So if you work through a little bit of arithmetic here, and you know, A being the, um, the axis, what you'll find out, there is a nice cancellation of some terms, and you end up with a formula at the end that says that the mean power or vergence in the zero degree meridian and in the 90 degree meridian, that's the two um, principal meridians here, the vertical and the horizontal, um, is independent of alpha, the, the axis. And so it doesn't matter what the axis is. The axis can be anything at all. If you measure the power or the vergence in the vertical meridian and in the horizontal, you know, you always get the same answer, no matter how you rotate that lens. So that's a really convenient thing to have because that means that we don't really have to keep thinking about what's the axis of the cylinder in, in an astigmatic wave front. We're just always going to go with the horizontal and the vertical curvature because we'll learn everything we need to know. So that's a really useful thing. You know, okay. So that's the end of my little review from the last time I spoke. Now, some new ideas that are going to involve vector algebra. I'm going to tell you about the thing that mathematicians would call an operator, something that does something, a kind of function. Um, and there's a MATLAB equivalent, because they're all built in the MATLAB. Um, and the input is going to be some things that we're interested in, like wave fronts or maps of uh, wave front slope, uh, and the output is. So the Laplacian, if it's operating on a wave front, it's going to tell us the mean curvature. And the gradient, when we operate on a wave front, we're going to get a map of the horizontal and vertical slopes of that wave front. And if we use the divergence operator and have it operate on the x and y slopes produced by this guy, um, we're going to get mean curvature out of it. So this is a, kind of a quick, quick uh, cheat sheet of where we're going and why we're interested in the Laplacians and gradients and divergence. Um, and I think the main obstacle to using these built-in mathematical functions is simply knowing that they exist and what they mean. It's a, what I call the jargon gap. It's every field's got its own special terminology, its own language, and they might have some really useful ideas in that field, and you'd love to make use of them, but you don't understand what people are saying when they talk because they're speaking in jargon, they're speaking in technical language. So I'm going to try to translate these optical terms, or these mathematical terms, into a language we understand, uh, an optical kind of language. Right? So we'll get started with, let's go to Wikipedia and find out what Wikipedia says is the definition of a Laplacian. And this is copied straight from Wikipedia. Okay? So this is what you're faced with. This is the joint we have. Definition, the Laplacian operator is a second order differential operator in an n-dimensional Euclidean space, which is defined by the divergence of the gradient of that function. Thus, it is a twice differentiable real value function, and it can be written in two different ways, two different scripts. One is an upside down triangle uh, or an upside down triangle with a, with a square on the top. You see? And that's the symbology a mathematician would be used when they're talking about um, Laplacians. Or equivalently, the Laplacian is the sum of the unmixed partial derivatives in Cartesian coordinates. And there's the formula. This is the sum of all the second derivatives of a function. Well, that sounds like it could be useful to us because the second derivative is the curvature, right? So what I'm going to be telling you is that for a wave front, if this function up here, this thing that we're going to operate on, if it's a wave front, then the Laplacian of that wave front is the sum of the curvature, the second derivative, the curvature in the horizontal meridian, and the second derivative, which is the curvature in the vertical meridian. Add those two together. In other words, it's the horizontal curvature plus the vertical curvature. Twice the mean curvature. 
But to get to that, we really ought to go through a couple of steps because I told you, yes, I really haven't taken you through how did I ever get there. Okay, so the Paul is going to be a divergence of a gradient. Hmm. So what do they mean? Well, in vector calculus, the gradient was called a scalar value function. That's what wave fronts are. It's like the height of a hill. This is one number at every point on the hill. Just one number. It's not a vector. It's just a single number, a scalar. That's what a wave front's like. Um, <clears throat> uh, the gradient of a scalar uh, differentiable function of several variables is a vector field whose value uh, the partial derivatives. Okay, so that's what Wikipedia would tell you. And it would actually draw a picture for you. So if this, this looks like a kind of a cone or a sphere of some kind of a surface, according to this uh, map, uh, if you went to every place and look at the slope in the horizontal and the vertical direction, you draw a little arrow there. And the length of the arrow up is the vertical slope, and the length of the arrow the horizontal is the horizontal slope. And every point on the picture, you draw a little arrow. You need kind of a visual impression of how this surface is, uh, it is changing um, across across the field. Here's a plane. It's even easier to look at. It's just a flat plane, and the, the slopes are zero vertically and, and some number horizontally. It's the same all across the field. Okay, so to translate this into your optometric language, I would say the gradient of a wave front um, at point P, any point P, uh, is a vector. It has two elements. Those two elements are the wave front slope in the x direction and the y wave front slope in the y direction. Now that should sound familiar to anybody who's working with alarometers because that's exactly what a wave front alarometer does. It measures like the Shaft Hartman thing we got in the, in the lab, it measures when a wave front comes in from somebody's eye, it quickly measures the horizontal slope and the vertical slope. So that instrument is taking the mathematical gradient of the wave front. And the wave front. It's a machine that does this mathematical operation. And the result is a vector field. So this is the vector field. It's called a vector field because at each point I have to draw an arrow, not just a number. So that's half of the definition of little policy, which is the gradient, uh, the divergence of a gradient. That's the gradient. Now, what's the divergence? Oh, I'll just show you an example. Um, pretty much what I just said. The optical uh, instrument that we that we have, like an apparometer, will measure for us the horizontal slope everywhere in the pupil. It'll measure the vertical slope of the wavefront everywhere in the pupil. And then for any point in the pupil, like at that point and this point, you go to that map and find out what the vertical slope is, horizontal slope. And you go to this point and see what's the vertical slope. And it gives you the two numbers to draw an arrow. You come over here to the corresponding point, and you draw your little arrow. And you can draw as many arrows as you want, one for every point in that map. And sometimes we display the data that way. Um, if you get really good at it, you can look at that and say, oh, yeah, that's a swing of the lens or something. You can get really good at interpreting these kind of pictures and play with them and all. So this is what we started with, the wavefront phase. The instrument measures the slopes of this wavefront um, phase uh, diagram, and you end up with a ring aberration. Uh, description uh, based on slopes. <clears throat> and we do that kind of thing in the lab a lot. That's, we have routine software to do that sort of operation. Okay, to continue then with unpacking divergence of a gradient, what is divergence? Hint, say divergence. <laughs> Versus, huh? Magic word, right? <laughs> Versus. I, at this point, I remember fondly uh, a really good graduate student. In the, uh, in the school of years back, um, quite famous now, Julian Liu. Um, she ended up working with Don Miller and becoming quite famous as a result. But anyway, when she first came here, um, and her husband Talu, they had both studied optics in China and were very good at optics. They had a very high level of education. And, and Tal told me later he studied geometrical optics four times. And um, once as an undergraduate, once as a graduate student or a master's, once as a PhD student, and then he came to my lab and he did his PhD again. And here I am subjecting him to optometric optics, geometric optics for the fourth time. And I was the first time I used them, and he had heard the word virgins. And Julien, later on, she got so sick of hearing the word virgins. She said to me, 
Burgess, Burgess, Burgess. <laughs> That's all I've ever talked about in this building is Burgess. Well, that's not a way of saying Burgess, but anyway, uh, indeed. <laughs> We're going to talk about the divergence. And the divergence is basically the horizontal rate of change in horizontal slope. So as you move across the wavefront, the horizontal slope is changing. If you move horizontally, that's the horizontal rate of change in horizontal slope. And the other one is the vertical rate of change of vertical slope. Well, mathematically, that's represented by the second derivative of the wave front. And two together, this is curvature and that's curvature. So by the time we've now taken this vector field from the gradient and then subject it to the divergence operator, we end up with the sum of the two principal curvatures. And as we said in that little theorem, it's not just the principal curvatures you're adding, that sum is the same even if they're not the principal curvatures, because you can do it for any meridian at all. It's just so long as they're orthogonal. Take any meridian you like, you know, 30 degrees, and then 90 plus 120, take 120 and measure the curvatures of those two meridians. You get the same answer as if they had gone horizontal and vertical or if they had actually been lined up with the principal readings. It's always the same answer. A beautiful result. But it only works for spherocylindrical surfaces over the whole pupil, but what we're going to find is that it also exists at every single point on the wavefront. You just have to look locally, and that same rule applies. Okay? So, locally, all wavefront surfaces are spherocylindrical, so this Laplacian thingy is the sum of curvatures in the uh, orthogonal areas. And so here's an example. Um, put together an example of one diopter astigmatism up there, and that's what the wavefront looks like. Uh, mean curvature is constant everywhere. So it doesn't matter where you are on that surface. It doesn't matter one reason you look at it, no matter where you are, it's always the same answer. The Laplacian says the mean curvature is the same everywhere. And that's what makes those kind of lenses so easy to understand. Another example uh, is a pure cylinder. You know, we add enough defocus to the stigmatism with a, another cylindrical wave front. Again, mean curvature is constant everywhere. And the gradient that produced these two maps for us, and the divergence produced that map. So that's the way you can do it in that lab, right? It's pretty easy. Easy peasy. Questions? Yes, okay, good. What's the question? Doctor. <laughs> I have to ask a really dumb Rowan question. <laughs> I've come across Laplacians describing um, activity across a cortical map, so I realize <laughs> I totally understand how useful they are in describing curvature of surfaces and, um, and topology. Uh -huh. But I don't understand why we go to the Laplacian r rather than just looking at a curvature map. Well. What's what's the magic that the Laplacian gives us? What problem is it solved? It gives you the curvature map. You say, why don't I just okay. look at the curvature map? Well, I'm going to have to calculate it some way. And what we're saying is that if you use this Laplacian operator, you will get the, the sum of the curvatures. In the two yeah, so it, that's it, right. it is an entity that the, that is a definition of curvature at a point. In no, other words, yeah. If you've got slightly different curvature in different directions, it's uh -huh. the way to get the mean curvature mean across all curvature. orientations. Oh, all orientations at that point. At that point. At that okay, point. Right. Right. Um, But unless, if you really want to solve the problem completely, you need like two equations, you have two unknowns. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's one equation. It tells you what the sum is. If you want to know another equation, you look at the product. Right. Now you've got two equations, two unknowns, the product of, of principal vertices. And that's what we're going to do. That's what the Gaussian curvature map tells you. When we compute the Gaussian curvature, now we'll know the product of the two vertices, the two meridians, yep. and we know the sum. So you have two equations, two unknowns, you can solve for the map completely. We know what you wanted to know what you did for any orientation, every point on the way up. Okay, good. I'm not good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. No other questions, we can jump into what Mr. Jacobi told us and Mr. Gauss told us about curvature. A little bit more complicated, but we need them if we actually are trying to get to the point spread function of the eye. This is what I said this lecture is going to be about. How do you compute the point spread function? A couple of different ways. 
Okay, so I'm going to try to start approach this topic from an optometric viewpoint. Everybody in optometry knows about Prentice's rule, all right? Better. <laughs> First year optometry, optometry 101. Prentice's rule. Any other kind of what it is like that. And what it's all about is if you have like a nice little lens light here in the textbook sort of picture, and if a ray comes in uh, some distance away from the center of that, of that lens, and displaced by some amount of R, that ray is going to get bent. And you ask me, what angle does that bent of ray, uh, that refracted ray, what angle does it make with the horizontal, with the center, uh, the chief right line being the middle of that lens? Right? And so that's what we had called angle delta. And what uh, good old Mr. Prentice proved, pretty simple result, he's a pretty famous guy. I mean, the Prentice reaches part of the Prentice lecture, I'll ask that too, but anyway, and Steve Burns, he won the Prentice award. And so this is a time, this is a pretty big deal. Prentice's rule is that this angle delta is simply the product of how far away you move and the power of the lens. Power of the lens is f, the distance you move is r. That product tells you this angle delta. Now, if you think about vertices of the ray, the way we would describe vertices of the ray too is to say, well, it's um, it's this distance r the base here divided by that distance there. So, or, I mean, that's the slope of this ray. It's, so, it's this distance r divided by that distance d, r divided by d. So, uh, this angle of delta is equal to two different things um, the displacement r times the power of the lens, and the, the displacement r divided by the distance. Um, and the inverse of d is the vertex of that ray. So, versions of the ray, which we define as being one over the distance d, standard orthometric definition. Because of that Prentice rule, it's also equal to delta over r. The delta is just the slope. So that means it's equal to the derivative to w by dr over r. So this is kind of a radial uh, slope through here. It's not necessarily the horizontal vertical. It's any um, meridian through this lens. Um, and this is the kind of equation you see banded about quite a bit when people are start talking uh, about verges. It's uh, we kind of calculate the verges of a wave drop. Well, we'll take the first derivative. Divide by the distance r, and that tells you the verges. Now comes the tricky bit: is that we want to be able to find where some of those rays end up on the retina. Because here's just one example: where some ray comes into an eye. And it's going to propagate forward. If it was a ray that was, you know, if this eye was perfectly focused, it would end up right here in the, you know, so let's say, the folia, right there on the axis. And that would be seen as dotted line. That would be called a reference sphere centered on this point right here. That would be a reference radius. That's where you would like the ray to go to have a perfect eye. But this eye has some kind of an aberration, and consequently, this is the wave front that we actually have. And our ray has to be perpendicular to the wave front, so I draw a second ray. This shows where the ray actually goes. Okay? Now, this is going to be like one point in a point spread function. Because we're imagining that a light came in as a plane wave, it's produced this wave front, and we'd like to know where all those rays ended up. Well, here's one of them, it ended up right there. And there's going to be lots of them. We're going to be in all different kinds of places. And if we just knew where they all ended up, that's the answer. That's kind of like the point spread function, where the light got spread out because of uh, for optical reasons, right? So we want to know where that is. And when I first started in this game, well, I've actually had quite a circular route, but I started the second time, well, I don't know, maybe four years ago, with the help of a mathematician over in the math department named Kobe Rubenstein. Kobe said, "Oh, this is this is easy. What you do." Is you make measure the slopes of these wave fronts, and then just it's a straight line from an exit pupil. This is a uniform medium. Just propagate that straight line down there, build this your image plane, and you're done. Yeah, pretty easy. But when you do that, the answer comes out in you know, millimeters on this scale. So well, that's not really what I want. I don't want millimeters on this scale. I want a visual angle. I want to know what is the if this projects out into the foliage, this one's going to project out into some place in outer space, and it's got a, it's got a, kind of got an eccentricity associated with it. I want to know the visual angle of this. 
Well, that visual angle is the angle of the sign. I want to know what this angle psi is for that point. Now, there's a little bit of trigonometry to help us figure it out. What we have to do is we first look. Um, oh, uh, what I haven't told you is that, well, this angle theta that the reference makes. With the, uh, with the axis um, as a tangent, right? The tangent, uh, have I got that written up there somewhere? So the tangent of that ought to be no, I don't do that one. I want to do this one. Delta. The tangent of delta is this distance from P to Q divided by the distance from here all the way up to there, right? That reference distance. Now we have to make an approximation. We say the P to Q is almost the same as P to R. Now if it is, then now we've got the tangent of the angle we're interested in. Okay? All right. So there's two approximations that go on there. One is that P Q is approximately equal to a q. Uh, no, 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 it's it's that a q and the two of them. Which one did I just want? And then o r. Um, p r and p q. Yeah, p r and p q. But they are approximately equal. And that's the uh, that's the first approximation. The second approximation is that AQ and OR, right? AQ, that's from up there all the way down to there is approximately the same as from way up there to here. So we're going to need like this tiny little distance. Yep. Now if you do that, this angle that we're interested in saw, the retention of it, is equal to the other or R, but that's a probably P Q over O R O R. And that's the tangent of the delta. So from this geometry, we would conclude that this angle here is the same as the angle there. That's the angle between the margin, the, the real rank, and the reference rank. They're about the same. So our optical calculations based on weight on slopes will tell us this number, but we can immediately interpret it as this number. So that maps from the wavefront in the wavefront slope in the pupil plane to visual angles on the retina, all in one step. We don't have to calculate anything. There's nothing to calculate. It's the same quantity according to this geometrical argument. It's based on two little approximations. So, in theory, uh, yeah, therefore, don't be smart. In English. The visual angle, which is to say the eccentricity of a point on the retina, uh, is equal to the slope of the wavefront error function at point A. Well, this is the basis of producing what people call a spot diagram. A spot diagram is where all these little points get. You know, everywhere you trace them all in, find out where all they are, and you have a million little spots, and every one of them has a visual angle, and so you can present it as a geometrical optics point spread function. But it's nothing more than the slopes of the wavefront errors. There's no calculation required. So if you have an aberrometer, it's already measuring for you the slopes of the wavefront error function. You're done. You can immediately just present those data as being the geometrical optics point spread function. And that was the way we have in the past computed the geometrical optics point spread function in our MATLAB software. But there's nothing to calculate really. But if you start with a wavefront, you do have to calculate the gradient. But if you have an instrument that measures the gradient, there's no calculations at all. Okay, so that is the first way of measuring the, or producing the geometrical optics point spread function. And it's called a spot diagram. And you use it in engineering, optical design for donkey's years. And people get really good at looking at a spot diagram and figuring out what the aberrations are. Optical designers do. And what I have to do for you now, now is to show you a different way to do it. And this will bring in the notion of Gaussian curvature. And it has some benefits, benefits and drawbacks. 
to touch base with um, some things you may hear right now. And let me just say, oh, you're doing for time. Not too much. It's not time. Um, I might skip through this and let you read it. But the, um, the implication is that, well, I'll do one example. One example at the top. Lots of people know how you calculate the Bohr circle for a circular people. How big is the Bohr circle? And we always know it's pretty easy. You just have to know how many diopters that you focus, and you have to know the pupil size, you multiply one times the other. And that's the diameter of the Bohr circle. And so the area then is, since it's a circle, a circular disk, is pi over 4 times the square of the diameter and the square of the vergence error. Well, that simple idea, we carry that in our heads, we use it a lot of times. It also applies if you have an elliptical pupil. It also applies if you have an axiomatic wafer. If you have a rectangular pupil. In all cases, in the end, the area of the border rectangle is dependent on the product of the, um, of the principal vertices. Border rectangle is B1 times B2. B1 that one, B2 is that one. So it's, it's like B1 times B2, B1 times B2. In all cases, the area of a Bohr patch divided by the linear area is the product of the principal vergences. So the product of principal vergences is what I'm going to tell you. Mr. Gauss invented that, did he? He didn't call it Gaussian, he's probably too modest, but we call it the Gaussian curvature. Oh, that's the two principal curvatures. So the end result is that the Gaussian curvature of a wavelength area is the ratio of the area of the Bohr patch visually, in terms of milliradians, uh, square milliradians of visual angle, divided by the pupil area in millimeter squared. Okay. So the implication is the Gaussian curvature links for us. Pupil irradiance, that's how much rate, how much force do you have in some little area of the pupil? How does that end up producing retinal irradiance? And it, it's just a matter of how does the area of that little part of the pupil get compressed when it gets projected onto the retina? Yeah. And the units work out beautifully for us. The Gaussian curve is the ratio of the area of the blur patch, the visual area in angular terms, divided by the pupil area in linear terms. So it's, it makes it a really sweet sort of result. Okay. Now, I'm going to bring one more link with alphametric, with alphametric world, and that is uh, a former professor here in Bloomington one time ago in uh, law. Back in the 1970s, he sort of threw a monkey wrench into optometric optics. Said, you know what? We can we can use matrices to figure out or to, to describe the optical properties of an eye and figure out the way uh, the way rays get refracted when they go through an eye. It was all based on Prentice's rule. So they then in the thing called the the, the uh, Diaptric power matrix. And there are certain pockets of the world, especially South Africa and other places, where people have taken this concept and just run with it. And they do. A guy named Bill Harris published a paper every month on this topic of matrix optics. Um, and it's all based on Bill uh, Russell Long. And Mike Keating, who was an optometric professor in, uh, in Michigan uh, for many years, um, and they invented a wavefront. Uh, a, a, a vergence or a power uh, matrix. And if you put it into power in the terms that we are familiar with, me in particular, this matrix is in the upper left hand corner, the mean sphere plus the astigmatic power in the horizontal and vertical meridians, that's J0. And this down here, this is the mean sphere minus the power in those meridians. And in the two Triangles turns that way is the power in the 45, 135 degree angle. So those are the three terms of a power vector, M, J0, and J45, the three components of any spherical cylindrical lens or away from. Now, what Mike Keating did in 1980 said that just incidentally, he said, oh, by the way, 
it turns out that the determinant of this matrix is equal to the product of principal versions of principal powers. Is that remarkable? Yeah, oh, I'm scratch my head for once and well, let's just try it out. Um, What's a figure out how you put power vector terms into this matrix? It took me a long time to figure that out. But the way you find a determinant is you multiply this number and that one and then subtract this one and that one. And this is a position called a determinant of a matrix. Okay, let's do that. Well, this one times that one is m squared um, minus j0 squared. So it'll be a minus j0 squared. And then we have to subtract this one and that one, which is j45 squared. So group those two negative terms together, we're, we're pretty. Um, because I look at this and I think, oh, J0 plus J45, what are those squares? That's the astigmatism J in a kind of a polar format, the magnitude of, uh, of the astigmatism. Um, so I'll substitute M squared minus J squared. And this is another astigmatism. That's what the determiner is. But if you factor that one out, multiply that out, it's m plus j, and then minus j. Well, guess what? This is the principal power in one meridian, and this is the principal power in the orthogonal meridian. And so, indeed, this virgins error matrix that Mike King and Bill Harris worked with so many years, um, if you take the determinant of it, once again, you're finding the product of principal versions, which is what I'm saying is the Gaussian curvature. So one could sort of start with this kind of matrix and go straight to the Gaussian curvature um, and figure it out. Okay, application of Gaussian curvature to a radius mapping. In a way, this machine does everything for you. If you go to a, a, a view of the Shackhoffman waypoint sensor, uh, the device is meant to figure out how little rays are displaced, and that's how we normally use it. But it can also be used to figure out how intense the point is in each place using the map that I presented. Right. So the light flux is just going to be it's going to be subdivided in the pupil plane in that little square. It's going to probably to the right now, it's probably going to be deformed, it's going to be a different shape now and everything, but there will be a sort of inner radiance of the retina. That flux is going to be in some certain area, and the flux divided by the area is the irradiance. So that's how we map from the pupil plane to the retina plane. And we know where each little spot is because we can draw that to the arithmetic as well. So this is the basis for finding point spread functions the other way, but it's based on irradiance, not just ray tracing. It's not a it's not a simple spot diagram. It's a weighted spot diagram, and the weighting is the irradiance calculated using Gaussian curvature. And guess what? We're finally going to get Mr. Jacobi gets to be in the picture here because this is exactly what this mathematician Jacobi said 150 years ago. He was interested in, in a real mathematical problem. If you're going to integrate some function over two dimensions, um, dx dy, but dx and dy are actually functions of another set of coordinates, she's how do you solve that kind of problem? He said, ah, that's a matrix that will allow you to go from one coordinate system to another, figure out what these integrals are like, and that's kind of like what we're doing there. So in all our uh, humble terminology, the Jacobian matrix here, that's what Wikipedia says, you know, if, <laughs> you know, if you can understand that, you don't need me, right? But, and this is the formula for it. <clears throat> but the Jacobian matrix has four partial derivatives. This is the horizontal slope. And so the VA by the alpha by dx is the rate, horizontal rate of change of horizontal slope. And this is the rate of change vertically in horizontal slope. Mm -hmm. This is the rate of change uh, uh, of vertical slope horizontally and the rate of change of vertical slope vertically. Those are the four numbers. Right? Well, guess what? <laughs> That's exactly what Mike Keating and Bill Harris and, and Rob uh, put into their emergency error matrix. So A, B, C, D are these numbers. A, horizontal rate of change in the horizontal slope, B is the horizontal rate of change in vertical slope. C is the vertical rate in the horizontal slope and the vertical rate in the vertical slope. And the determinant of that, then, is going to be the same as the determinant of the Burgess error matrix that we were looking at before. 
And with that, in mathematicians' language, that's called the Jacobian determinant. So, in short, the Jacobian matrix is nothing more than the dioptric power matrix that, uh, that our friends Keating, Long, and Harris uh, have been so excited about for some idea. So, in the end, then, one can write the what we call the um, illuminance weighted spot diagram in very different ways that are entirely equivalent. One of which, although well, I should put I should put a transmission back there in because you, sometimes the pupil is not completely clear. It might attenuate some light in different parts relative to other parts. Yeah? So you can put a transmission factor in there. But this illuminance is basically is inversely proportional to the Gaussian curvature. It's inversely proportional to the make to the determinant of the Virgin's error matrix, and it's inversely proportional to the determinant of the Jacobian matrix. They're all the same thing. Yeah. But this is the famous one because that's in all the that's even in MATLAB. Uh, this is in you know in the minds of like three people in the world who actually use this matrix algebra all the time. And Gaussian curvature is something that we can talk about. It's actually quite useful for other reasons as well. So that's how you do it. Now for the final comment is that um, there are both benefits and costs with interpreting this result as a point spread function. Right. It's not all benefit. So benefits are that if we map the illuminance distribution using this Jacobian matrix method, it gives a more accurate result than is obtained by conventional mapping of unweighted spot diagrams, because it tells you the intensity of each spot, not just where it is. And that sense is more accurate. And it's really useful to, to take the things like caustics in the retinal image and finding out their source in the wavefront aberration function uh, up in the pupil plane. It's all made possible by inspection of the Gaussian curvature map. But there is a cost. And the cost is that, firstly, the illuminances of different rays refer to different sized retinal areas. Some rays, when they get the retina, they cover a large, they're representing a light over a large area. Some are representing a more small area. So, to be useful for things like computing the image of an arbitrary object by convolution with the point spread function, you don't want that method. Because it's like apples and oranges. You know, some points in your spot diagram represent high illuminances, some represent low. And furthermore, they're not even evenly spaced, which is a real pain in the neck because then when you're representing a digital object for convolution, it's really helpful to have them on very, you know, all the pixels in your image are the same size. Yeah. And you're going to convolve that with a point spread function that also has. Um, Pixels all the same size, and in fact, they're the same size as the ones in your object. <laughs> and to do the convolution, it has to be that way. So, this Jacobian method does not give you what you need to do a convolution. Now, it is possible to work from the Jacobian method back to a, a nicely laid out point spread function where all the pixels are the same size, but when you do, the result is identical to what you would have gotten with the simple spot diagram. And you lost all the benefit of the Jacobian method for reviewing caustics and real high energy level places. So that's the benefits and the cost. I'm going to finish with a couple of examples for you. Now these will be the this is the Jacobian method showing you how what the illuminance spot diagram looks like um, and is weighted by uh, by local luminance. So it's in uh, luminance. This has got three modes. It's got defocus astigmatism and some spherical aberration. And on a gross scale, uh, this is what the point spread function looks like. But it's color coded. You see all these little points in there are color coded according to this map, telling you just how much light is in each of these places. So obviously in here, it's pretty dark. These are pretty weak. But boy, there sure is a lot of light going on there. Even some little red spots on this thing where it's really hot. And this is a logarithmic scale. So this is like a thousand times brighter there than it is there. In terms of irradiance on the retina. It's really, really highly concentrated light. And that's what people call a caustic. So if you want to talk about caustics and starburst is my favorite example. You look at the stars and you see little radiating lines coming out. Those are starbursts, those are caustics. And you want to calculate what a starburst ought to look like for your eye or mine, you have to go through the Jacobian method. 
and you blow it up and you can see, you know, you, I don't, well, the other thing is, it's very fast, you know, it's like a, a 125,000 arrays are traced like that. It's a really fast way to compute these point spread functions. Uh, and you can see all the points. Every one of these is a, a, a weighted spot. Um, we have some red right ones in there, some yellow ones. Oh, no, the red ones there are really a uh, really beautiful caustic pattern. But when you, uh, if you put it into a conventional point spread function where all the pixels are the same size, then a stand, which you have to do even for ordinary uh, spot diagrams, because the spots are not equally spaced, you know, they are wherever they are, and you have to bin them with a histogram to try to get it into a, a, a neat little arrangement where all the pixels are the same size. If you do that, the result from the conventional PSF is the same as from Jacobian PSF. It's just it took a lot more effort to make that. And you've lost all those beautiful colors telling you the details about uh, what they're known. It's just really more any more points. Uh, but one of the benefits is, is that with the Jacobian method, you can find out where the caustics are located in there. So for people that are interested in caustics, that's a better way to go. Here's another example comparing the um, uh, illuminous weighted point spread function spot diagram versus the conventional spot diagram. Here you're judging brightness by the density of rays. Here you actually have numbers for every single ray. You don't have to do density count mapping. But that's a gross scale. And you find the process that way. Uh, one more example. You're running out of time. Because I want to spill. Last second here is a challenge now uh, to members of the audience, especially Matt. What if we can develop some graphical software that help visualize the three dimension of point spread function? Because whatever everything I've told you about, about this point spread, you know, this light is being propagated right through to the retina. And then we put a retina there, or an image screen, and say, what's the distribution of light? Well, you could have done that anywhere along the trip. You know, and so through focus point spread function. So every position you stop, you get another point spread function. And so one ought to be able to visualize that volume of light as it propagates through to, to the focal point and beyond. Now, the closest I've come to that has been, which is kind of like looking at a, a, um, a wavefront going through an aberrometer, where we break the wavefront up in little squares and see how, the, how those little squares propagate. Uh, and here's one example as the light propagating through the whole pattern kind of gets complicated, and you end up here with a point spread function. Well, that's kind of following away from, but I don't really want to follow away from, I want to follow the point spread function, even if it is out of focus. You follow from point to plane to plane to plane. Um, and here's another example. That's a simple astigmatic point. You see it goes through a focal point and ends up with a border circle on the retina. That's useful, but what I want is something that's kind of more like this. Here's some examples from MATLAB about the way it renders surfaces, uh, especially like this one right there. You know? Um, Sergio Barbero, I love that, right? He's, he's interested in caustic. He's one of our colleagues. He's a postdoc there years ago. He's interested in caustics and, and catastrophes. And a catastrophe is you're walking along a surface like there, you get to the edge and you fall off. <laughs> you fall off the edge and you go pow. You end up there somewhere. You see? And here, that, that's a beautiful event. That's a, that's a, that's a catastrophe. <laughs> um, and I want to be able to visualize that kind of caustic surface is it in three dimensions. It's a caustic surface in three dimensions. How do you do that? Man, that's great graphic visualization tools, but um, I'm not good enough to figure and I don't have time to figure out how to do it. But it would be really nice now that we know how to map the caustic points and how to quickly calculate the point spread function, which is what diagram it is. Um, as the light propagates, do we visualize that in three dimensions? Because all of these things, maybe you grab them, you can rotate them, twist them, and really get a good sense to see how light is propagating uh, in that way that I. So that's my challenge uh, to Matt. I went to all this trouble to put this lecture together, and then I'll make him do some work for a change. <laughs> and so make his graphical skills get more.
Okay, so that's everything I know about calculating geometric optics point spread functions two ways <laughs> and their relative benefits and, and drawbacks. So from your point of view, the code you've already got works just great. If all you want to do is convolve point spread functions from human eyes with objects, I'm going to change the thing. But if you're interested in caustics and catastrophes and things like that, this other method has, uh, has virtue. Okay. It'd be nice to be able to visualize it more thoroughly. Because you know, I've been starting to read books about catastrophes, and they all talk about the catastrophe surface. You know, when all we're doing, we're running planes through that surface to see what the catastrophe surface looks like on intersection. But we should be able to measure that catastrophe, catastrophic uh, event. And as, it, as light propagates through all the way to the retina, and we've got surface out of it, you know, I think we have a much better way to visualize um, and understand what Sergio Barbero has been telling us uh, in his, uh, his adventure into catastrophic theory. Because he's got a really nice, as you finished with Sergio, um, if you don't know, he's in uh, Madrid, one of Susanna Morehouse's first graduate student. Sergio is currently interested in the problem of predicting uh, diplopia, triplopia, polyplopia, yeah? and these kinds of double images, triple images, is the sort of thing I see all the time. I went to see the moon. Yeah, I put my glasses on because without my glasses, I see four homes, you know, um, and most people do because of the aberrations in their eye. Well, can we predict how many moons I'll see? Well, we really ought to. And it really boils down to how many of these little caustic points do you get? And little clusters of caustic points. If you get two clusters of points in your caustic, that's going to give you dipropia. If you got three clusters, you have tritropia. If you've got five, you're going to have, you know, um, quadric, well, whatever. Uh, the uh, polyplopia is all about how many little clusters of points of, of light you get in your point spread function. Uh, and this is the approach that we're using to try to, to solve that problem. And that's got a real optometric benefit, I think, um, in predicting uh, uh, and then how could you then go about fixing the problem if you are in, in the job of creating some really high-tech lenses or other technologies for eliminating polyplopia uh, of, of optical origin. You know, why don't you go about doing that? Well, what can you do? So it's a, it's a fun topic. Yeah. So there's, there's a real payoff for that as well. Okay, well, I've gone over time. Well, of course, we did start a little bit late. Um, but uh, thanks very much for coming and hearing the story. It's, uh, it's good to see so many people interested. Thank you.